and everybody was uh, confident that in a short period of time we will have a cure for the disease. Well, after 20 years of investing a lot of money, there is no cure for the disease. I have to say that Huntington's disease is not a simple disorder, but it has a very complex clinical phenotype. I have also to say that the pathology is not uh, selective for a certain brain area, but it depends on a number of parameters, including the size of the repeat of the mutation and also the length of the progression of the disease. We have very effective genetic intervention that probably could decrease uh, the uh, number of cases and it could, they could even eradicate the disease in certain families. Uh, the disease uh, has multiple pathogenic mechanisms, but so far we are not sure, sure of what is the hierarchy, I mean, which is the first step in pathogenesis and, and what are the secondary mechanisms. And finally, I would like to say that there is evidence that there are genetic and environmental modifiers and that these things could help us to find the treatment. As I told you, uh, from the clinical point of view, this is a complex disease with motor, cognitive, and psychiatric uh, symptoms that uh, may change from patient to patient and that depends of the size of the expansion and also of the length of progression. Also, from the pathological point of view, it is obvious that Huntington is present in all neurons. For instance, you see the beautiful presence of Huntington's in pyramidal neurons in cerebral cortex, but there is loss of neurons in certain brain areas, depending of the, uh, again, of the size of the mutation and of the length of progression, and there is also evidence of inflammation, like you see here with the proliferation of the microglia. Uh, most people believe that Huntington's disease is a disease of the striatum. This is not true. <coughs> the striatum is one of the areas more predominantly involved, but uh, there may be in one certain patient, there may be, for instance, a 60% dropout of neurons in certain areas of the striatum, but there is a 50% in the frontal cortex and 40% in the thalamus and 30% in the cerebellum. So and there are even patients with very large expansions who have lesions in the muscle. So th th this is the idea. I don't want you to get the idea that this is a selective disorder of the caudate nucleus. Now, for a number of years, we have considered that Huntington disease and symptoms and disease severity was something that was fully determined by the length of the expansion. This is, uh, for instance, we could say, well, if you have 39 or more repeats, then if you live a normal life, you're going to have a disease. If you have from 36 to 39, you may or you may not. If you have uh, from 30 to 35, you will not develop symptoms, but then you could transmit a larger expansion to one of your children and you could have, uh, and, then, and they could have the disease. Well, we know that this is not so simple. This is not so simple. For instance, let me show you that. This is a plot of age at onset in the large family from Venezuela where the gene mutation were discovered. And you could see that there is a relation, wait a minute. There is a relation between the size of the expansion, there is an inverse relation between the size of expansion and the age at onset. But the variability is tremendous. For instance, these guys here with 40 repeats, they could have age at onset at age 33, 34, or at age 70. So 40 years of difference in the time interval of the developing symptoms is a large variability. Now, uh, we already know, because there are a number of studies that have been performed in the Venezuelan family, just comparing age at onset in the same family 
and in the same family comparing uh, concordance between patients from two generations, parents and children, or between patients of the same generation, I mean, uh, subjects from the same generation, I mean, siblings, they share the same amount of DNA that parents and children. But children, they share more environmental factors than parents and children. So, I mean, doing some kind of calculation, it's been known that that variability, that variability could be attributed to two sources. One is the genetic source that accounts for 38% of the variability and the environmental variability that is up to 63%. So, if the CAG repeats do not explain the whole picture of the disease, we could take advantage of that. I mean, we could take advantage of that because we could investigate the environmental factors that modify disease onset and modify them according to our interest just to make a disease more benign. Or we could look for genes that modulate a better prognosis and interact with the pathways coded for this gene and modify the disease according to our interest. For instance, my colleague, Dr. Lopez Sendon, which is on the audience, uh, performed one study of one of the putative environmental factor, which is his education. And what Jose did, he started from a cohort of patients from registry, about a little more than 1,300 patients, and then he looked at the number of variables, including uh, age of uh, at onset, including CAG repeats, including uh, age of the subjects, education, and, and the scores in the clinical scales that you use to evaluate these patients. Jose worked looking for uh, uh, the effect of the independent variable, which was education, splitting the sample in two halves, one with more than 10 years of education, which essentially means people that went to university and people who have only basic education. And then he looked at the number of variables, such as uh, age at onset and, and scores in the different cognitive scales. And what he found was that subjects that went to the university in green, they have a lower age at onset that subject that only have primary school. And that, that was very suspicious because our hypothesis was the opposite, that education may delay the progression of the disease. So what Jose did was look at the age at onset in subjects who do not have a known progenitor involved with the disease. 5% of patients with Huntington's disease, so in this sample, around 50 people, did not recognize his father, their father, or their mother as affected by Huntington's disease. The children may be adopted or may be illegitimate or whatever. And what you see is that age at onset in subjects without unidentified parent, progenitor with the disease, age at onset was seven years later that those subjects whose mother was known to be affected and nine years later that those subjects whose father was known to be affected. So awareness, awareness is one variable that tremendously modifies age at onset of the disease. So then Jose look at the impact of education on the motor score, the psychiatric score, the cognitive scores, 
and the functional cost. And as you see, he found that for all percentiles of the groups, there was a difference between these subjects that had higher education in green and those one who had lower education in blue. Uh, these patients, with the, I mean the motor score, the higher is the score, the worse is the patient. And the same thing happened with the psychiatric score. The opposite happened with cognitive. Cognitive, the lower the score, the worse the patient is, and the same with functional score. And the difference was not irrelevant. The difference, for instance, in the motor scale, the difference was three points, which is, is more or less equivalent to disease progression from one to two years in this cohort of patients with this length of repeat. Now, let me go back to the pathogenic mechanisms. This slide summarized the most, the best known pathogenic mechanisms in Huntington's disease. There is a very recent paper which appeared in PNS on September 10th this year, implying that Cooper may be a very critical issue in Huntington toxicity. And that Huntington toxicity may be related to two mechanisms. One related to binding of the protein to Cooper, and the other completely independent of Cooper that is mostly related to aggregation of the protein and translocation of the protein to different subcellular compartments. I mean, in fact, these guys have been treated drosophila models of Huntington's disease with uh, Cooper depleting drugs and they have found improvement. So this is something that we have to take in consideration and I didn't have the time to include in my slides because I read this paper a couple of days ago. But outside that, I think that this diapo summarized more or less the main mechanisms. According to that, a number of compounds have been tested in Huntington disease, including food derivatives, including modifiers of gene transcriptions like histone diacetylase inhibitors, modulation of transcription of Huntington, which is his fashion now, it is now one of the fashions in the treatment of Huntington's, modulators of neurotransmission, this is a conventional pharmacological tool that has been, been used for many years, neurotrophic factors, uh, inducers of protein degradation, inhibitors of amyloidogenesis, and inhibitors of inflammation. Now, however, with all of these compounds, with all of these compounds, we have, we have a paradox. And the main paradox is that here, you will see that uh, these compounds, all of these compounds, which are more or less the ones that I put in the previous slide, I mean, most of them, they are here in the preclinical stage. And in fact, there is only one that has been approved for the treatment of patients with Huntington's disease, which is tetravernacin, which has been used, I mean, it's been approved recently, but it's been used for more than 30 years in treatment of this disease. So the real problem that we have here is that it is very difficult to progress from this stage, which is preclinical, to this stage, which is availability in the pharmacy. And this is a problem, and we have to think why, why that happened. Now, I told you that one of the fashions now is inhibitors of transcriptions, and that's, that there is evidence in experimental models that they block uh, many of the uh, noxious effects of the mutation. But perhaps, before we design clinical trials with inhibitors of transcriptions, perhaps it is good that we go back and consider what happened with transplantation, because in any case, 
we're going to need to perform aggressive techniques infusing compounds into the brain of humans. And what happened with the transplants is that they were received with enthusiasm in the, at the beginning of the millennium. And now, after a number of years, we know that the transplant is safe. There's no question about that. It does not increase mortality. It does not increase disease progression. But it's unuseful. And in most cases, it does not survive. So, and, and the same thing happened, for instance, with deep brain stimulation in Huntington's disease. It's very effective in some cases from the clinical point of view and from the symptomatic treatment of some patients, but the disease continues to develop. Let me go back for a minute to the general view of the treatment of Huntington's disease. There are four possible treatments. One's eradication with genetical interventions. Two, symptomatic treatment. For the, at the moment, the, the evolution of patients with Huntington's disease is not exactly the same that it was when I started my, my career. Patients with Huntington's disease, they live better. There is a functional there is, there is a functional improvement for a number of years. So, I mean, subjects who die of Huntington's disease, they have a better quality of life for a number of years. Subjects who live of Huntington's disease, they also have a better quality of life than a number of years ago because there is a lot of money for the research of this disease. Uh, it's been very effective, the treatment, the, the pre-implantation diagnosis and the, the, the genetic intervention. So in some families, it could completely block the presence of the disease for small amount of money. And that could change the prevalence of the disease. I mean, there are a number of issues that could change the prevalence of the disease. Uh, these issues are, for instance, there is a reduction of fertility in the general population that could increase the prevalence of, of Huntington. There is, it's been reported an increment of fertility of the patients, mostly in women, because they have low prolactin levels, so they are more fertile. So that could increase uh, the prevalence, and there could be new mutations. Also, that could increase the net prevalence of Huntington's. There are a number of issues that could reduce the prevalence. One is the reproductive failure of these patients with large CAG expansions that n never reach age for reproduction. And the other thing are the genetic control. So there are a number of variables, and we do not know how the disease is going to evolve in the next few years. Now, at the last part of my talk, I'm going to do the same thing that we've been doing for the last few years, which is reporting what are our research is doing here. I mean, we are receiving money, public money, from the government to do research. So probably we should, we should um, explain what are we doing with this money. And this is the uh, group of Huntington's disease in its moment of glory a number of years ago. In, in the uh, in at a meeting in El Paular, and here are the leaders of the different groups uh, who perform different things. Jose López Sendón is performing clinical trials. Uh, Javier Fernández Ruiz and Manolo Guzmán are mainly involved. I mean, I'm sure that you know all of them, but just in case, uh, Jordi is, Albert is very productive. He's been involved in a number of ideas, mostly. Uh, some of them relate, some of them, but not all of them related with BDNF. Maria Angeles has been involved with uh, glial condition medium. Uh, Jose Lucas is also involved with many things, but I uh, took autophagy, and Jose Ramon Naranjo with calcium metabolism, and Mariano Carrion, which is here with nano particles. So I'm going to go over. Now, 
Remember the slide where I present you the different stages of development of treatments, preclinical, not going into clinical. Why? Why? What are we doing wrong? Well, there are a number of issues. First of all, there are differences between the human brain and the animal model's brain. For instance, if we go into if we go into infuse compounds that inhibit transcription uh, into the rodent brain, if these compounds are able to diffuse one millimeter with one point of infusion, you will cover the whole striatum. In the human brain, that probably has an striatal volume, I mean, the rodent brain, mouse brain probably has an striatal volume of point, point 0.15 cubic centimeters. Human volume is 90, 90 cubic centimeters. So one point is not, is not enough to cover this triatum. Not to mention the need to cover other areas of the brain. The other thing is that, for instance, if we perform, if we perform um, infusion of one compound or treatment of one compound for four weeks in an animal, I mean, the average life of one, of one rodent is about one, two years, two, 100 weeks. So four weeks is one over 25. In a human subjects, if we would like to prove efficacy of a putative neuroprotective agent, probably we will need to infuse the human lifespan divided by 25. So probably we need to infuse a compound for three or four years. So th these are differences that we, we should be aware of it. Now, the other issue is that we may start too late treating patients because at the time that the patients develop symptoms, probably more than 50% of the neurons in the striatum are lost. So unless that we have compounds that are able of resurrecting dead neurons, uh, it is unlikely that the treatment is going to be effective. In order to deal with this issue, there are a number of attempts, uh, trials that have been performed in subjects, carriers of the mutation, who do not have yet symptoms. These studies are the TRAC study, which has been mostly a European study, the PREDICT study, which is a worldwide study. And the TRAC study has identified that we could use some biomarkers, for instance, the rate of atrophy of striatum and other brain areas, the rate of progression of atrophy. We could use it as a biomarker for testing compounds. And the PREDICT has found that there are some cognitive, sophisticated cognitive testing that could be used also as an index of progression of the disease. Uh, we, we are also working in some issues that I'm going to show you just in, in one minute, because we need tools that could be applied to subjects, sensible tools, which we could apply to subjects that they do not have symptoms. And that takes me to the last point of this slide, which is the need for better evaluation tools. The tools that we have to measure the status of patients with Huntington's disease are insensible and for the most of it, irreproducible. So unless that there is a large therapeutic effect, we are not going to find anything. In order to look for for this kind of improvement in both sensibility and also uh, in efficacy, looking for efficacy, we have been involved in a work with a company, a Spanish, small Spanish uh, technological company, which mostly what they do is that they take a short video of a patient, 10 seconds, patient rest, resting, and 10 seconds counting from one to 10. And they analyze uh, a certain area of the body. In this case, the data that I'm going to show you is just the face. They analyze, they quantify the number of movements 
and that information could be sent by email or it could up be uploaded in a web and the physician could read the results. I mean, every day, if, if, if this is the thing. So that simplifies that you don't need to go to the clinic every day or something like that. I mean, there could be something like uh, another type of, of control. Uh, that's been done in collaboration with Jose Lopez and Don and, and Momentum, which is this, this company. So, I mean, they take the video and then they could send it to the physician. The physician could work with it, count and delete it. And, uh, and they're looking for going into other parts of the body to look for other things. Let me show you the first data that we got with the, with the patients of Jose Lopez Sendon. Three minutes. These are in blue, you see the baseline, I mean the resting counts of the control group. And here you see patients with Huntington's disease. This is one patient with neuroacanthocytosis, which is a dystonia affecting the face. This is patients with Parkinson's disease, and this is a severe Parkinsonism, which is PSP. And there are some patients, very few patients, so we cannot be sure of that. We need to do that in more patients, at risk of Huntington's disease that are in an intermediate position between patients with Huntington and controls. So that, that could be a very simple method of evaluating and counting that. Well, let me go just very quickly in, in the last two minutes to a number of to two studies that we have been performed in part in Spain. We, we have been leaders. And one of that is with the first compound, predopidine, the first compound that produces a global improvement of motor features in patients with Huntington's disease. It's a compound that was developed by Professor Arvid Carson and that is an, an atypical neuroleptic in the sense that it stimulates receptors if uh, there is no occupation of the dopamine receptors in general, and it blocks receptors if there is too much dopamine into the medium. Uh, let, me, let, let me go back to, uh, I'm going to pass these slides because um, uh, the time. Well, this compound has been tested in a cohort in, in, in Europe of 400 uh, patients, more than 400 patients, and after six months of treatment, there has been shown that there is a significant difference between the patients treated with 90 milligrams of predopidines and those treated with placebo or with 45 milligrams. The improvement is not tremendous, but it is global and also involves a number of symptoms, including ocular movements, dystonia, hand movements, etc. The only thing that has not improved with this compound is uh, chorea, which is the only thing that improves with tetravenacine. So we have one compound, tetravenacine, that improves chorea, but nothing else. And we have one compound that improves everything else, but not chorea. And finally, I, I would like to mention that uh, there is a very recent clinical trial that has been performed in Hospital Ramón y Cajal. Jose López Sendón and Juan García Caldentay were the driving forces of, of this study. And this study was, uh, was uh, organized after we saw the beautiful results that have been obtained by Manolo Guzmán and Javier Fernández Ruiz in animal models of, of uh, Huntington's disease in different animal models. And what we have done is one study, we include 26 patients. It was a double blind randomized study with, a, it's a crossover, so the patients are treated for uh, 12 weeks with one co compound, with the active compound and the other group with placebo. And then there is a four weeks um, withdraw, washout, and then uh, the, the, com the treatment is switched. Uh, the, the, the study was organized for safety. So we were looking mostly that the patients did not become psychotics with the cannabinoids or did not increase suicide rate or something like that. And in this case, we have to say it is completely safe. We didn't have any complication, any severe 
side effects. But it was also organized for at least uh, as one initial step for um, efficacy. And in the terms of e efficacy, we consider changes in the total uh, motor scale or changes in biomarkers. And um, there is no change in the total scale and there are no changes in biomarkers. The only biomarkers that change was the CB2 receptor that increased in the, during the treatment with placebo. And there is also something intriguing. I mean, these patients allow for a lumbar punction in one phase of the study and after the end of the last phase of the study. And we've been looking for a number of things into the cerebrospinal fluid, including proteins, monoamine metabolites, interleukins, inflammation, and a number of things. And what we have seen, the only thing that is interesting, is that during the treatment with Sativex, uh, uh, amyloid peptide 142 increases. So I don't know if this is important for people working on Alzheimer's disease and cannabinoids, but I mean, th theoretically, one would speculate that cannabinoids solubilize, if you want, amyloid, and increase cerebrospinal fluid concentrations. Well. Thank you very much. This is my last talk. This is to acknowledge uh, my former group of research for their contribution. And I, I am happy to take any questions if, if we have the time. So we, we have time for one or maybe two questions. Is there any question in the audience? Jordi. Atrás, allí atrás. Good morning. Hi. Uh, what, what do you think? What is the age that you have to start the clinical trial and also? Uh, when you choose the patients, uh, also this must be a good point also to have uh, what's the number of uh, CAG repeats. <coughs> you know what I mean? <coughs> when you choose the patients, uh, it must be a lot of variability between the, <coughs> the number of repeats and also when you choose, uh, when you must start the, the, the clinical trial. And they must be in early stages or in later stages and the different drugs that you show in the different clinical trials. Jordi, I don't know if I understood you well because there was a lot of noise. But uh, if I understood you correctly, is uh, about details, about how to organize a clinical trial in terms of CAG repeats, intercell disease severity, length of progression, etc. I think it depends what are you looking for. What are you looking for? For instance, if, if you're looking for safety, if you're looking for safety, um, I would suggest that you get a big sample of patients. Probably you're going to need at least several hundreds and you would like to have a sample which is relatively homogeneous because, I mean, if you take patients with 60 repeats and with 39 repeats, your treatment may not be equally efficacious in both subjects and there will be a lot of noise. So in order to have a sample which is several hundred patients and relatively homogeneous, then you need a multicentric probably, probably multinational trial. I mean, the, the predopinin trial, it took about 440 patients. The Relusol trial, which we performed before, took 537 patients treated for three years. We made a tremendous mistake in the Relusol trial. The mistake was that we were extremely concerned about toxicity of Relusol over the liver. And we use a dose of Relusol that 
in 500 subjects did not produce a single elevation of liver enzymes, but did not produce any therapeutic effect. So this is the problems about organizing clinical trials, that at the moment, with such insensitive tools that we're using, you need several hundred trials. And that cost not several hundred millions, but tens of millions of euros. So you burn out a compound if you have a negative trial. Now, let me go back to another issue. For instance, there is now a fashion, a fashion about Mediterranean diet in neurodegenerative disorder. And there are a number of studies, including some from our group and other people, suggesting that olive oil may have a neuroprotective effect on Huntington's disease. If I would like to do an olive oil trial in patients with Huntington, I would do it in end-stage terminal patients, that they have a gastrostomy. They have a gastrostomy. They are fed by a tube placed in their duodenum. So I could inject olive oil there blindly without the patients, and then I could look at the parameter. I could look at a biomarker, if there is more oxidation or less oxidation or whatever. So it depends of the trial that you would like to perform. It depends of the question that you have in your mind. 